morning. I greet you in the name of the risen Christ. It is so good to be with you this morning. A couple of reminders. I head out on maternity leave tomorrow. Uh, well, technically after worship this morning, I am out. So uh, I will be praying for you and you will see Mark and I and hopefully both of our kids floating around here in March. So we look forward to coming back and being in your midst then and I'll keep you updated via email and newsletter and Facebook and all those fun things. So I look forward to sharing our good news with you. Another announcement we have this morning is actually coming to us from Laura Hightoff. So I'm going to invite her to come up. Would you talk into the mic so we can get you on the camera? <laughs> good morning. Morning. Hi. Um, I'm speaking to you on behalf of our youth group who has, um, who has a couple of big projects coming up. Um, we have SGU, Summer Games University, this summer, and then um, we have some youth that are going on a mission trip to Louisiana um, this summer as well. And so um, next week, Sunday, we are going to have a Valentine's dinner. Um, it's going to be lasagna, salad, and um, garlic bread. So I will be in the back of the church, in the opening area, um, selling tickets after the service to um, help raise money for these causes. Um, I think sometimes the youth get a bad rap, and so I just wanted to reiterate how important these things are for our youth to be the growth of the church. They are the future of the church. They're going to be the people sitting in the pew someday. Um, last year, SGU was life-changing for my son. Um, I got two texts from him the entire week, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> but I got one text saying I'm having a ton of fun, and I got another text saying I just gave my life to Jesus. And so, um, if, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> doesn't mean he's perfect now. But uh, if you uh, have any reservations about contributing to the youth or seeing the, the impact of these things on our youth, um, just come to Refuge someday and see the youth band play together or talk to some of the youth that have been to SGU or after we go on this mission trip, talk to them about the impact that that has had on their lives. So I just um, encourage you, even if you don't have a significant other to come with, it can be erotic time. That is, that's what I always say, it's romantic without the man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So um, just come, have fun next week, and uh, support our youth. So thank you. I believe you can also pre-order bouquets. So it'll be like someone gave you flowers. It'll be wonderful. Now, beloved, will you please stand and greet one another in the name of Christ Jesus. join me in a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, it is good to be in this place. It is good to be together as the body of Christ to worship your holy name. Help us to worship you with our whole heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our being, to give everything over to you now in this time of prayer and praise and opening up the word. Thank you, God, for being present with us. and Help us to be aware and to be transformed by that presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. My name is Becky Kanucky. Please stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. You will find it in your bulletin. <clears throat> the living God is with us. And with all of creation. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. We long for our souls to rest in the peace which Jesus gives. Jesus also said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We come today to learn from the God of all knowledge. Jesus said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we come to worship, let us cast our burdens on the Savior and find that he bears our burdens and lightens our load. Jesus invites us to come. It is our joy to say yes to his invitation. Please remain standing and join in singing our opening song, Gather Us In, number 2236 in the Faith We Sing book. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. See in this space our fears are not dreaming. Brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in the blind and the lame. Call to us now, and we shall awaken. We shall arise at the sound of our name. We are the young, our lives are a mystery. We are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sown throughout all of history. Called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your sons and your daughters. Call us anew to be salt for the earth. Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well and teach us to fashion lives that are holy and hearts that are true. 
But in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away, but here in this place the new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in, all peoples together. Fire of love in our flesh and our bones. You may be seated. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. You can find it in your bulletin. The living God is with us. A passage from Luke 18, 18 through 23, 1835 through 1910. May we be enlivened by these words to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. God. You can find the gospel reading on pages 853 and 854 in your pew Bible. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, praised God. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there was named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner? Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our singing together is... A simple tune found in the faith we sing, number 2056, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. 
good, that's how good to me. God cares for me. God cares for me. God cares for me. God so good to me. God loves me so. God loves me so. God loves me so. God so good to me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God so good to me. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you one last uh, authentic, exposing myself, I guess, story where we talk about ministry and, and something that's kind of funny and quirky that I've noticed uh, about myself and my friends, and that is that when I was in junior high and high school, I was a little bit of a nerd. Uh, I was a band geek, and in my junior high and high school, you know, it was large enough that you couldn't be a band geek and an athlete at the same time, and so I did band and show choir and choir, and, and even though our show choir was really good, we were still considered nerdy by all the athletes, and so that was my crowd, right? And I never ran with the popular people. Now, granted, I was popular in the band, but it's not saying a whole lot. And what I've realized is that that feeling never went away. That feeling of, of being the shy, sort of nerdy person when I was outside of my element has never left. Uh, my best friend, Melissa Drake, and I joke about the time we met. The first time we met, we didn't talk to each other. And in both of our heads, it was because we were going, oh, she's so cool. I don't know if I can talk to her. We were grown pastors when we met. We were adults, and we were in a gathering of young clergy, and we couldn't speak to each other because we still had that attitude from middle school and high school that you don't come up and talk to the popular kids, right? And we perceived each other as the popular kid. It was so, it's so funny. And so I just lift that up as a, well, first of all, as a way to tell you, I always feel like the nerdy kid in the corner, no matter how old I get. And to say that I'm sure we could all name something like that inside of ourselves that continues to impact us. And we could probably trace it back to middle school and high school if we really thought about it, uh, which which is also why I work with middle school and high school students, so they can feel good about themselves. <laughs> All right, will you join me in a time of prayer? God, we just thank you for opening up your word to us, for telling us stories of Jesus that we might learn from him and grow to be disciples in his image. Help us to see him as he is this morning and to be inspired by these stories of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So when we look at most societies in the world, including our own, we realize that there are typically about three categories of people. There are the elite. They're the one to three to five percent of the population that control most of the resources. They make most of the rules. And you can tell who the elite are because they tend to make alliances across many boundaries. It's government, religion, military. They all tend to form together in this elite section. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are the multitudes. There's the working class, uh, blue-collar laborers. Most of them are living at or just above or even below the poverty line. They tend to work at or around or less than minimum wage. Um, here in America, these tend to be the folks that have to apply for welfare. Then there's the middle. It tends to be the smallest group. And the middle class 
it serves as a bridge between the elite and the multitudes. They tend to be middle man management. In companies, they have this desire and this belief that if they work hard enough, they could move up into the elite class, even though the elite class tries really hard to keep them in middle management. And even though they associate professionally with the multitudes, they tend not to want to be with them socially. We can see this also not just in how people's salaries break down, but where they tend to live in towns. The elite and the multitudes tend to live really far from one another. So there's also a geographic difference, and then there's the middle floating around. This reality is true, was as true in Jesus' time as it is in ours. And the stories that we see today show up Jesus interacting with each, with a person in each one of these categories. Now I should pause here and say, if you're reading along in the book, We Make the Road by Walking, my sermon took a little bit different twist than Brian McLearn went in his chapter. So if you're reading it, it's still a good chapter. I highly recommend it. But if you're anticipating me going somewhere this morning, I'm just going to tell you now, I'm not going there. So... So we see Jesus meeting people from each category. And the first one that we read about is Jesus encountering one of the elite, a rich young ruler. We assume that his family had been wealthy for some time. In order to be a rich young ruler, he would be old money, uh, to, to use a phrase. And this man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is his ask. You know, he has everything he needs right now, so what he wants to know, what do I have to do to get to eternity? And Jesus and this young man have an exchange about part of the Ten Commandments. And they have to do with how you operate in society, right? Don't steal, don't lie, don't murder, honor your father and your mother. And the young man is like, of course, I do all of these things. And, you know, as I was reflecting on this story, I thought, it's relatively easy to do all of these things when your life is easy, right? When you have enough food to eat, when you have enough wealth that you can have whatever you want, it's not so hard to be, to not steal and to not murder and to not lie and to be nice to your parents because your parents are probably nice or they pay somebody to be nice to you. And Jesus pushes him a little bit. And he looks at his wealth, and he looks at this man's heart, because Jesus really sees into the heart of people. And he says, you have to sell your things. You have to sell your things and follow me. Sell your things, give it away to the poor, and follow me. This invitation that Jesus gives goes back to the two greatest commandments that he had listed before. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors as yourself to extend what this man had in material blessings to his neighbors, the multitudes. The young man in the story walks away. He's sad because he's wealthy. And Jesus, we didn't quite read this part, but Jesus says, how hard is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, indeed it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Making money, earning money, is, is never wrong in the Bible. Let's be clear about this. Being in love with your wealth is what's wrong in the Bible. Being so in love and so dependent on your money that you're not in love with God or that you fail to see who your neighbors are, that was the sin of the rich young ruler. Not being rich, mind you, but being dependent on his wealth that he forgot to trust in God. In our next story, with the blind beggar, Jesus is meeting one of the multitudes, and probably the lowest of the multitude that you could actually get, because being blind and a beggar, he was completely dependent on the mercy and compassion of those that walked past him. Back then, in society, he was probably considered unable to work. I mean, they didn't have white-collar jobs like we have. They didn't have, you know, all those other fancy compensations that we've made for folks who have lost their eye eyesight. And so 
He just sits by the side of the road and begs for money. And we notice that the crowd who's following Jesus, the people who are leading this walk from to Jericho, try to silence the man when he cries out to Jesus. And what's interesting is that at this point, the crowd following Jesus is probably mostly multitude themselves. They're probably all working class folks, and here they are trying to silence one of their own ranks. This man also has a request for Jesus. He asks for sight. He asks for his vision back, not for wealth or riches or perfection. He just wants to see. And the physical healing that comes with that would make him a part of society again would make him useful, would restore his connections to other people. And when Jesus heals him, his response is to get up and praise God and to follow Jesus, to do what we would expect someone to do who had, ex who had experienced a miraculous healing. The last story that we have with Jesus is the middle class. Middle management. How many of you, admit it, how many of you were singing the song? The keyest was a wee little man. Man, was he? Yep. It's amazing how much that actually follows the scripture, right? You could almost sing it while she was reading it. Tax collectors in Israel at that time would usually be Israelites. So this is a Jewish man who was collecting taxes from his fellow Jewish multitude at this point and giving the money to the Romans who were the elite in society. Usually they were scorned, not only because they were working for the Romans, a lot of people were working for the Romans at that time, but because they were allowed to take more than what the actual taxes were to make themselves wealthy. The Romans didn't care about that. As long as they got their cut, Zacchaeus could collect extra from his fellow Israelites under the law so that he himself could become wealthy. Now, what's interesting about this encounter to me is that Zacchaeus has not asked Jesus for anything. He's just there to watch the spectacle. He's climbed up in a sycamore tree to watch the spectacle. It's a really interesting image. And Jesus doesn't offer up accusation. He merely says, I'm going to go have dinner with you. I'm coming to your house to have supper. And in response to this graciousness, Zacchaeus has a change of heart. And he starts giving away his wealth, half his wealth. And, and if he's defrauded anybody, he'll compensate up to four times. Now, what's, what's interesting about lining up these three stories together is that each man... Each man comes from a different, a different group of society. Each man has a different sin and temptation that he's struggling with, something else that's happening in his life. And the other part that I find mildly frustrating is that we don't get to hear how it ends. We don't know if the rich young ruler ever made the decision to follow Jesus' instructions. He may have. We don't know if the blind beggar continued to follow Jesus after he got used to seeing stuff. We don't know if Zacchaeus ever actually gave away his money or started living as an ethical tax collector. We hope these things might be true. But what these stories have in common is that Jesus sees each of these men as they are, as they really are. When's the last time we looked around and really saw the people around us? Jesus also doesn't seem to be passing judgment on any of them. He allows the rich young ruler to walk away without arguing with him or, or condoling with him. We're told, all we're told that Jesus feels towards the rich young ruler is love. He doesn't accuse Zacchaeus of anything. He just asks to have a meal with him. There is no judgment in the encounter with Jesus. And each man is faced with a choice once they encounter Jesus. They can ask and accept what's been offered, or they can go back to the way that it's always been. Isn't it true, isn't all of these things true for each of us? 
Jesus sees us as we are. No matter what part of society you would put yourself in right now today, Jesus sees you as you. And there is no judgment. But there is an invitation. There's an invitation to follow. There's an invitation to praise God. There's an invitation to be set free from whatever in your life is keeping you from God right now, keeping us from God. Our unique temptations and sins have been identified, and Jesus is offering us healing. We have been given a chance in this encounter with Jesus to change to accept the gift that we've been given. And then we have a chance to make a decision that we don't hear about in these other stories, to keep changing. I love that Laura mentioned about her son accepting Jesus at Summer Games. We have this conversation with our youth every year at Summer Games. Summer Games is great. We call it a mountaintop experience. We pull you away from all the struggles of this world, and we hit you with a whole lot of Jesus and a whole lot of worship, and it's really easy to get fired up and to accept Jesus. It's when you go back on Friday afternoon that it becomes a walk, that it becomes a journey, that the decision becomes a challenge. We don't know how these men responded, but we could talk about how we're going to respond. Because sometimes we can have a big shift in an encounter, but it's the follow-through that we need each other to help each other on, to stay there, to stay out of our temptation. So no matter where you find yourself this morning, no matter where we would identify ourselves this morning, I hope we would hear Jesus' invitation to come, to follow him, to walk with him, to set aside whatever is keeping us away from him, and to be a child of God. Amen? One of the other... One of the other scriptures that was attached to the chapter this week of our book was Ezekiel 34. And Ezekiel 34 is a cry, is an accusation from God about the shepherds of Israel, the leaders of the people, and how the shepherds of Israel have neglected their flock. They have chosen to keep the best for themselves and allowed their flock to starve to death. And what we're told when Jesus arrives is that Jesus is called the shepherd and he's the good shepherd. He's the gate. He's the shepherd that protects, that lays down his life for his flock. He's more like the man that will step in front of the bear or the wolves on behalf of the sheep, will lift up the lamb that has been left behind, will seek after the one even though the 99 are still there. That's who we're told Jesus is, and we see that when we participate in communion. Jesus is looking at his flock, looking at his friends, looking at the shepherds that he's trying to raise up as leaders in the church and, and pleading with them and pleading with us to be different. And he takes bread, and he gives thanks to God. And he breaks the bread. And he gives it to his disciples as he gives to us and says, Take, eat. This is my body, which I lay down for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. And when the meal was over, he took the cup and again he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples as he gives it to us today. This is my blood of the new covenant. I pour it out for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the freedom of your hearts. As often as you drink it, remember me. Will you pray with me? God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and unfermented wine. 
that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, that we would follow the good shepherd and be good shepherds ourselves. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other as we go forth from this place into ministry to all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will those helping to serve please come forward?
We've come now to our time of prayer. Let us open our hearts to God. Gracious and loving God, we begin by giving you thanks. Thanks for all the ways in which you have blessed us. God, we confess to you those things that have kept us from you. Whether it's physical ailment or assurance of our own independence. Anything that has kept us from drawing closer to you, God, we turn over to you now and we ask not only for forgiveness, but for freedom. God, we pray for those loved ones that we carry on our hearts this morning. For those on our prayer list. Even if we do not know their stories, you know their story. Help them to feel your presence. Help them to feel you walking with them. Raise up a community around each one of them to speak about your love and your mercy and your compassion. God, we pray for our communities, for every member of our society, for the wisdom of our leaders, and God, we pray for this year church and the church universal. That we would be places where your kingdom is built and where your kingdom shines forth out, out, out into the world. God, I know that I cannot pray the prayer of all our hearts gathered here. And so I ask that each one of these hearts would be open to you, to speak to you, and to hear from you now. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a good and right and holy thing, beloved, to respond to God by offering back gifts and service in praise of the way that we have been blessed. Will the ushers please come forward to receive this morning's offering?
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all the gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power of Join me in the prayer of dedication, a covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. You can find it in the United Methodist Hymnal, page 607. Let us pray. I am, I am no, no longer, longer my own, own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee, or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low by thee let me be full let me be empty let me have all things let me have nothing i freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal and now o glorious and blessed god father son and holy spirit thou art mine and i am thine so be it and the, and the covenant, covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Please remain standing and join in, our, in singing our closing song, number 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, in your United Methodist hymnal. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear. Things I would ask him to tell me if he were here. Scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea. Stories of Jesus. Tell them to me. First let me hear how the children stood round his knee. And I shall fancy his blessing resting on me. Hearts full of kindness, deeds full of grace. Into the city I'd follow the children's band, waving a branch of the palm tree high in my hand. One of the heralds, yes, I would sing, modest hosannas, is key. Well, then we are about to close our service with our, our sound response. I've decided to follow Jesus. We'll, we'll just do the first verse, but my that is my prayer. That's my prayer is that you will sing the line of this song, that you will sing the first verse, and that it will be true. That we have all decided to follow Jesus, that we will cast aside those things that he calls out in our heart that are keeping us from God. And that we will be set free in order to follow him more fully and to be in love with God with all that we are and all that we have. Go forth in the name of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing the first verse of I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. 